Welcome to chapter 4, section 4.1, inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. Okay, so we think back to Math 1050, we learned about inverse functions, which is where the domain and range trade. So an inverse function will undo what a function does. We've already used inverse functions a little bit this year in chapter 1 when we were solving right triangles, like story problems like for finding the angle of elevation or the angle we need to put a ladder against the ground or something like that we use an inverse sine or cosine or tangent function in our calculator to find that answer and it's really easy when we're plugging in a positive ratio and we're getting out that positive angle between 0 and 90 degrees but then if we start to need to work with functions where we can plug in a negative ratio what angle are we going to get at? So that's where we start to learn about these functions instead of just using them to solve triangles. Okay, so we'll go through some guidelines here together on inverse functions. Remember that for a function to have an inverse, it is also a function. The function has to be one-to-one, -one, which means it will pass both the vertical and horizontal angles. So if we think about our sine and cosine functions, they look something like this which means they will definitely pass vertical line tests just fine. But when it comes to horizontal line tests, they are going to violate that all over the place and cross more than one point infinitely many times, right? So in other words, we can't just take a sine function and turn it into an inverse sine function that's actually a function where we can plug one thing in, get one specific answer out every time without restricting its domain. So the inverse function, if we were just to do the inverse relation, where we didn't restrict it at all, it would be something like this, which is obvious that it would fail a vertical line test with more than one output for each input, unless we restrict it. So the idea behind what we're learning today, where we're restricting what quadrants we're going to get our answers from, has everything to do with making our inverses into actual functions. Okay, so since sine and cosine functions are not one-to-one, -one, which is what I was just talking about, their inverses are not functions unless we restrict the domain of the sine or cosine function, and that will affect the range of the inverse sine or inverse cosine function, okay? One big thing to be aware of, don't mix these up, because this is a common mistake to make that we suddenly s somehow start to think that an inverse cosine is a secant, or an inverse sine is a cosecant, or an inverse tangent is a cotangent. Those are not the same thing. Inverses and reciprocals are different things. I think the reason we get that idea is because earlier on in math, we learned that the, the reciprocal of 3 can be notated with 3 to the negative 1 power, and that gives us 1 over 3. Well, we have the fact that sine is 1 over cosecant, right? So wouldn't inverse sine be 1 over cosecant? Or be just cosecant? Wouldn't that mean the same thing? It does not. Okay, so just be aware of that, because that is something that might cause you issues if you try to do problems that way. In this case, since these are going to be inverses, we're going to plug in ratios and get out angles. So for our inverses, we will plug in ratios. Get out angles. That's how functions work, right? Plug something in, get something out. Um, nor we're used to our regular functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent. We plug in an angle, we get out a ratio. So we're switching those. So when we're working with secant or cosecant, we're not plugging in a ratio, getting out an angle. We're still plugging in an angle, getting out a ratio. It just so happens that the ratio itself is the reciprocal, right? So we're, I hope... I hope that makes sense, and maybe I'll be able to illustrate that more as we go along somewhere if it comes up. It might actually pertain better to section 4.2 than to section 4.1, so we'll hold that thought until next time.
All right, moving on, let's talk about these inverse functions, shall we? So there's two different ways to notate the inverse sign. We can either use the inverse notation with the negative 1 power, like we learned in Math 1050. So that would be like if we have the function f of x equals sine of x, then the inverse function of x will be the inverse sine of x, right? So that notation is one we're familiar with that I just talked about the risks of doing it that way, but we're familiar with from Math 1050. We also have this way of writing an inverse sign called arc sign. And I don't know what the mathematical history of this is. I'm just telling you that this is two different ways to mean an inverse sign, and they both mean the same thing. They both accomplish the same thing. It's just two different ways to write it. And some textbooks or uh, mathematicians will prefer to use one over the other, and we're just going to use them interchangeably and be familiar with both. Okay, this is kind of what the graph of an inverse sign would look like. What it is is it's taking the inverse cos the uh, it's taking the actual sine graph, which would have looked like. Yes, it's doing the inverse. It's trading the x and y values. So this actual sine graph, you know, it would keep going this way, this way, keep going forever, right? But we're just restricting this to this piece right here from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. So that's quadrant 4 and quadrant 1. And then we're trading the x and y values to get the inverse, like you can see here. So instead of having a point at pi halves 1, which is what I'm trying to illustrate right here, pi halves 1, we get the inverse point at 1 pi halves. So the domain and range of just trading. Instead of plugging in a ratio, I mean plugging in an angle, getting out a ratio, we plug in the ratio we get out the angle. Okay, so because of that, the domain and range are going to trade, but remember the domain has been restricted, and so therefore the range is restricted in a different way than we might anticipate or be used to. Okay, so let's talk about the domain of this function. Let's look at our graph. You can see, let's just erase the rest of this so we can focus on the actual inverse. You don't have to know what this graph looks like. You don't have to memorize it. You won't have to graph any of them. We're just using the graph to help us understand the function itself. So you can see the domain from left to right on our graph is from negative 1 to 1. And the range from the bottom to the top our graph is from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. When we define what quadrant angles are in, we generally use these types of numbers because we're getting out angles, plugging in ratios, getting out angles, right? So this, negative pi halves to pi halves, would encompass quadrant 4 and quadrant 1. We did our little unit circle type of graph. We're going to have our positive angles from 0 to pi halves, and we're going to have negative angles from negative pi halves to 0. And so the values we get out of our function have to be in quadrant 4 if we plug in a negative ratio, or in quadrant 1 if we plug in a positive ratio. And we're going to give those quadrant 4 angles a value that is negative. Okay, hopefully this makes sense as we go along and start doing some examples. So let me just try to write out this explanation. Um, if we plug in a positive ratio we are going to get out so you know function mentality plug something in get something out get out a negative 
quadrant for angle. Nope, that's the answer to the second part of this. I love it when I mess stuff up. So the easiest way to fix this would be to put this in. So we plug in a negative ratio, because cosine is negative in the fourth quadrant, right? Remember as well, all students take calculus. So sine is positive in this quadrant, but sine is negative in this quadrant. So if we plug in a negative ratio, negative sine value, that's our fourth quadrant, we're going to get out a negative quadrant for angle. Okay? But if we plug in a positive ratio, it doesn't matter which inverse function we're talking about, we are always going to get out a positive quadrant one angle. That sharp part should be easy. That's just like solving a right triangle. You're always going to get an angle between 0 and 90 or 0 and 2 pi halves, right? That's a positive quadrant one angle. That's if we're plugging in a positive ratio. When have you ever seen a triangle with negative sides so that you're in a real life problem? You know, you're negative 5 feet from a tree. No, you're just going to do positive numbers. So you're always going to plug in positive ratios, get out those positive quadrant one angles. So now we're messing with that note, that thought so that we can plug in negative ratios, get out negative angles. Not for like real life problems like we would have used this for, but just in solving problems with these functions, these inverse functions. Okay, my video, I feel like it's getting too long. I think maybe I've done enough explaining that we can just go full force through this last part. So inverse cosine has two different ways of writing it, cosine negative one or arc cosine. Cosine is, um, the inverse of a piece of the graph starting from here downward and then to there. So it's basically this function, this part of our cosine function. If we kept going, it would keep going. Do, 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 right? We're just keeping just that portion so that we have it passing the horizontal line tests. And then we trade our x and y values so like this point right here at 0, 1 turns into a point at 1, 0. And this point here at pi 0 turns into a point at 0 pi. So again, that's how that inverse works. I didn't mean to delete all of that quite so abruptly. OK, so this is the inverse function graph. And again, let's look at our domains and ranges. Pretty much the same as before. From left to right, we can plug in ratios from negative 1 to 1. And then the range is going to be over two quadrants, one for positive values, one for negative values. But this time, our range starts at 0 and goes to pi. All right, so see how the range of inverse sine is different than the range of inverse cosine. And that's really, really important to understand when you are evaluating inverse functions. Plugging in a negative ratio is going to give you a quadrant 2 angle instead of a quadrant 1 angle. So let me write that down well, like I did before. Plug in negative ratio that would be these numbers over here on the left side of the graph. We get out a positive angle but it's up here in quadrant 2 from pi halves to pi. Get positive quadrant two angle. Right? And then uh, if we plug in a positive angle, the answer is always the same as it would have been if we were just solving a right triangle. So we get a positive quadrant 1 angle, just like we would expect to get from 0 to pi half, 0 to 9. OK, so the difference between sine and cosine is, well, nothing if your ratio is positive. Plug in a positive ratio, get out a positive quadrant 1 angle. 
But if you're plugging in negative ratios, inverse sine and inverse cosine exist at different quadrants. Cosine is in quadrant 2, positive quadrant 2 angle for sine is a negative quadrant 4 angle. Let's look at, look at some.